Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very glad to be joined once again by Bill Kaufman, one of my favorite writers. If you're unfamiliar with Bill Kaufman, not only is this conversation going to be a treat, but when you inevitably decide to read one of his books, you are just going to enjoy every single page. Bill is a contributing editor to Chronicles magazine. He's written for many, many publications, the American Conservative, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times Book Review, The Nation, The Counterpunch, all different publications from all over the spectrum. I'm telling you, I can't even encapsulate for you what his writing is like, but he is fantastic. I thoroughly enjoy reading Bill Kaufman. We had him on last to talk about the film Copperhead, for which he wrote the screenplay back in 2013. That was a Ron Maxwell film. So we talked about that. There was a, that actually became a chapter of my book Real Descent, my brand new or brand newish book that you can check out at realdescent.com. Bill is the author of many books. I've written a review of at least one of them. I wrote a review of Ain't My America, The Long Noble History of Anti-War Conservatism and Middle American Anti-Imperialism. He's the author of a biography of Luther Martin. Not Martin Luther, by the way. America First, Its History, Politics, and Culture. And the book we're going to be talking about today, which is Poetry Night at the Ballpark and Other Scenes from an Alternative America. Bill, welcome back to the show. Oh, Tom, it's great to be here as always. It is a thrill to talk to you. I will point out to people, I am talking to you. I'm doing Skype on my end. You're on a telephone on your end. And let me just say, Bill, if you and I had been high school classmates and we had been aware of this technology at the time, I would have voted you most likely not to have Skype. <laughs> So when I looked on the sh on the notes for today and it said no Skype, I thought, you know, Bill, I wouldn't have it any other way with you. Yeah, I know. I'm afraid. I've heard I'm also one of the last of the cell phone holdouts. But uh, but I oh, how but about I do, that? But I do have, we do have this rotary phone I'm using, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? All right. Look, I want to talk about your just wonderful new book, Poetry Night at the Ballpark and Other Scenes from an Alternative America. This, these are your writings from 1986 to 2014, selected, carefully selected, perhaps capriciously selected, uh, idiosyncratically selected, but organized into, into wonderful categories. I mean, I just had, my wife can attest to this, I had an absolute thrill. It was an absolute thrill reading this thing, and there's so many topics to cover that maybe I'll just have to have you back uh, every three days or something. But let's start off with the, the literary angle, because you have written on history, you've written on current events, you've written on politics, but you've also written on American authors. American writers who have been of interest to you because of the themes and their values that they've, they've expressed. And I jotted down a few names that, that I found interesting. But what I found interesting in particular is the, the beat generation, the, the people like uh, Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. You pointed out something to me about them that I hadn't realized at all, which is what were his political leanings? <laughs> Um, it's it's funny, and uh, in his biographers tend not to know what, what to make of it. I mean, Kerouac was a uh, author, of course, of On the Road, which is the seminal work of the uh, uh, the Beat Generation. Uh, he grew up in he was a French Canadian uh, kid who grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and in a sense, he spent his life always trying to get back to Lowell. Um, he was uh, at the same time that he was uh, this uh, handsome uh, football playing uh, hep cat. Uh, who was, uh, you know, hanging around with Neil Cassidy, Allen Ginsberg, and these guys? He was also he was politically he was always a Taft Republican, and it's not it's not a case of well he got old and cranky and yelled at the kids riding bikes on his lawn or anything like that. Even when he was a young man, there are fascinating letters between Kerouac and, and Ginsburg. Uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg, probably the most prominent poet of the Beat Generation, uh, who grew up essentially in a, in a kind of very left wing household. And, you know, they're arguing in their letters uh, in between talking about different, you know, kinds of uh, dope they've discovered about, you know, the 1948 or the 52 uh, presidential campaigns. And it's funny because Ginsburg is supporting uh, uh, kind of Paul Douglas, who was just the worst kind of centralist, centralizing economist, um, a uh, very much a, a, a cold warrior, you know, a man who believed that, uh, you know, Power should be exercised judiciously by a credentialed few at the top of the pyramid. Uh, and you have Kerouac, who's a uh, big supporter of Robert Taft, you know, and who's a, uh, 
you know, distrust big government. Uh, it tends to be sort of isolationist, you know, uninterested in, you know, in, in foreign wars and such. And so it turns everything on its head, you know. I mean, this is, as you well know, the, pro- the problem is that uh, to a large extent, um, American pop culture, when it, when it views politics, it's always team A, team B, you know, red or blue. And, you know, there's so many colors in the spectrum and, and the palettes that, uh, uh, you know, and they, so you can't, they can't deal, they can't understand a person, a person like Kerouac. And this is reflected in his, uh, you know, in his, in, in his writings where there's, uh, there's this, <clears throat> this, there's this duality, uh, there's this, romance with the open road um but there's also always this longing for some kind of anchorage and home and there's also just the celebration of the country and what uh, what Kerouac thought was being lost you know he said at one point uh, you know world war ii kind of changed everything because all these all these great guys that i'd known before the war were dead or they were coming back home and they were entering the machine you know uh and he just thought that there was a certain um, some kind of free form, refractory, uh, idiosyncratic America that was being suffocated by post war conformity. Is that basically what the beat generation was all about? If you had to summarize it, uh, I think so. I mean, obviously, it, it was it was multifarious, uh, and eventually it became commodified, you know, and. Uh, you know, like punk rock or any other interesting, you know, cultural development that uh, that springs from some sort of grassroots, and eventually, it gets packaged and sold. But yeah, the early the early beats were all like that. I mean, the most the most influential beat um, uh, publisher, Lawrence Ferlinghetti of City Lights Books in San Francisco, which put out Allen Ginsberg's Howl and many other works. Ferlinghetti was an anarchist who. Uh, who has, was also an early and consistent critic of the National Endowment for the Arts, saying, how can any self-respecting poet or artist beg for alms from the federal government? Um, you know, this, it's, it's interesting. This was in, in the mid-60s, and I know we're jumping around here, but hey, our, our thoughts are always digressive. In the yeah, mid, sure, I want yeah, that. In the, mid, in the mid-60s, you know, the early debate over whether or not we should have this, uh, this national arts bureaucracy there were a lot of artists in the in the no camp, um, and they tended to be people like Ferlinghetti or, um, you know, unorthodox or avant-garde types, who really worried that what was going to happen would be there would be the development of this official state art, you know, where you get the imprimatur of Washington uh, on art. Uh, and now today, you know, you find very, you know, when you have these occasional flare-ups, you know, debates over should government subsidize art, it's always sold as uh, cultured, refined uh, supporters of the NEA versus these these troglodytic, knuckle dragging morons, you know, who, if anything, may, you know, maybe they think that uh, tractor poles should be subsidized. But uh, and in fact, it's it's way, 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 or used to be way, way, way more complicated and 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 complex than that. But again, it's you know, nuance is always lost. Or seems to be. Yeah, and that's what I love about this book, is that chapter after chapter consists of a new, either somebody I didn't know about, or somebody whose details I didn't know, and it turns out that when you fill in those details, the person takes on, you know, rather a, a, a different uh, texture. I, I, I find that the person is not just easily categorized. And in fact, so few of us are easily categorized, and yet they try so darn hard to categorize us. Let me just share, if I may, though, before we move on. I love this little passage that you included from Jack Kerouac. He says, he's talking about Harry Truman. This is written in 1948. The war scare, I think, is just for the sake of squeeze-playing Congress into voting universal military training and the Marshall Plan. So he's even against the Marshall Plan. That's awesome. (laughs) It's a dirty administration with dirty tricks creating emergencies for its own political ends. I think we should arm and just dare anybody to attack, but I don't think we should be the aggressors. That wouldn't pan out. And then toward the end of your chapter on this, you have him saying, Woe unto those who think that the beat generation means crime, delinquency, immorality. Woe unto those who spit on the beat generation, the wind will blow it back. Again, not what you, not what you ordinarily get from 
from all this. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to jump around myself, if I may. Hang, hang on just a sec, because I, I, I did initially want to talk about some of these writers, but this actually makes me want to think of a, another theme that you raise here, which is that the left and right categories are... Sp- I mean, they fascinate me. I don't think they're completely useless. I, I don't go to that extreme. There is such a thing as a as the left. There is such a thing as the right. But it's so interesting to see the way they can sometimes bleed into one another. And so I do want to say something about politics, if I may, just for a minute. Sure. You have in here a chapter called Barry Goldwater, New Leftist, and I demand that you justify that statement. <laughs> well, I'm borrowing from Carl Hess there. Uh, Hess was the great, uh, uh, the, speech, uh, the great Goldwater speechwriter who'd had this really interesting ideological journey from the 50s journalistic right uh, up through the Goldwater campaign, and then he became a, a member of the IWW, the radical you know, anarchist syndicalist labor union, and he kind of dressed like Fidel Castro, and later on he was kind of an off-the-grid uh, type uh, and he's always a, a fascinating writer. Uh, and he, um, he remained friends with Goldwater even after the 64 campaign. And there's, uh, I, I think, I think the personal should always trump the political. And there's, there's a, a, a beautiful story that, uh, was told. And I hope I get it right. Cause I don't have any chapter in front of me, but, uh, it was, a, uh, one of the more radical protests, anti-war protests in maybe 68 or so. Uh, and even even the anti-war congressman didn't show up at this thing. It was in D.C. Um, and who shows up but Barry Goldwater, who's walking through the crowd uh, saying, hey, where's Carl Hess? Where's Carl Hess? And Carl, of course, has, has his, you know, the long, the long hair and the, the Che Guevara look. And he sees his old boss and they embrace in the middle of, you know, tear gas and everything else uh, and talk about old times. You know, I, 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 I love that story. Um, in part, I suppose, it's because I have a real anarchist bent. And I, I think that politics should occupy a very small role in our lives. Obviously, it doesn't. But, but ideally, political disagreements with friends would be like if, you, if you, one of you prefers Coke and the other Pepsi. I mean, okay, you know, big deal. It, it, it ought not to cause ruptures or cleavages in friendships. Uh, and it sometimes does, unfortunately. But the Goldwater Hess story, to me, was a uh, kind of a shining example of what ought to be. Um, actually, it reminds, it reminds you of something that's, that's a story that's not in this book that I, but that I've also liked. Uh, Eugene Debs, who was the great socialist leader of the uh, early 20th century, uh, and who was kind of an interesting guy again, who doesn't completely fit uh, the left-right, uh, the left-right grid. Uh, Debs was from Terre Haute, Indiana, and he was a really loved Terre Haute, great patriot of Terre Haute, and he just liked to sit on his front porch. The Terre Haute newspaper was very conservative. It was uh, it was Taft Republican, by which I, I don't mean the great Robert Taft. I mean his uh, rather more phlegmatic, you know, Wall Street father, uh, William Howard Taft. And yet the Terre Haute paper always endorsed Debs for president. Um, because they said he was a good neighbor. I always thought, wow, that's, to me, that's, that's the America that ought to be, and it sometimes is. This is not uh, directly related, but I'm reminded of a story that, you know, as always with your books, I learned something on every page. I hadn't known very much about the friendship between Franklin Pierce and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pierce is one of these presidents nobody knows about, you know, because he wasn't flashy and he vetoed unconstitutional bills and things like that, so nobody wants right. to talk about him. He was a failure him. to the Schlesingers, right? He was a failure, right, because he, he didn't launch the Civil War, so of course. <laughs> so, so he was very much out of fashion by the early 1860s, and yet Hawthorne still wanted to dedicate a book to him, apparently, and his publisher told him that that could seriously damage the prospects of the book, and he came back with essentially that if my friend's fortunes have fallen to the point where my dedicating a book to him would damage its prospects that badly, then maybe he needs the support of a friend more than ever. Yeah, yeah, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? And how, and how often, uh, 
how often does that happen today in literary and political worlds? You know, oh usually- my gosh, never! You would be dropped like a bad <laughs> habit. I mean, th- think about the way. Do you remember the 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 Lonnie Guineer Supreme Court nomination? Mm-hmm. And as soon as she was a friend of the Clintons or something, as soon as she ran into trouble because of her uh, Calhounian views on some subjects, they they treated her like she didn't even exist. I remember there was a story of Hillary Clinton walking down the hall, and there's Lonnie Guineer, and she just gives her this ice look like, and, and says hello, like they don't even know each other. <laughs> She's so past her because it's doing damage to her. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, the funny, the funny thing about Guineer, I remember one of the few pe- one of the few pro Guineer pieces I read at the time was by uh, the uh, Southern agrarian uh, uh, historian Clyde Wilson, who's editor of the Calhoun Papers, who loved yeah. Guineer. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, because she wanted to talk about the concurrent majority. Right. <laughs> Nobody's right. wanted to talk about this for a long time. Yeah, yeah but yeah. So especially, especially if you're the editor of the Calhoun Papers, you've got to get these ideas out there. <laughs> yeah, Pierce was a, uh, he had his problems. I mean, he was a, a, a doe face, and so, and he was, like a lot of, at, at the, the Democrats in the 1850s was kind of an expansionist who wanted Cuba and, and such. Uh, yeah, Levin's room for for slavery. So I'm not a big fan, but it's it's interesting that there was uh, novelists and filmmakers that paid so little attention to the American past because he's an interesting guy. You know, on his as he and his family were traveling by train to D.C. Uh, for his inauguration, uh, his son was killed in kind of a freak train accident. Um, his little boy, and it just cast, as you can imagine, cast this terrible pall over the administration, and his wife, who was, uh, you know, not really a, 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 a hale and sound woman in the best of circumstances, ended up spending the next four years locked in her room trying to communicate with the dead son, while Pierce wandered the hallways of the White House drunk. You know, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's just this really vividly tragic story, and it's always blown me away that, you know, someone should write a novel about Pierce, but... You know, we get 12,000 novels about Lincoln, but nothing about uh, Frankie. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's crazy. It's great. I mean, this is, again, this is why I like Bill Kaufman, because he'll talk about Franklin Pierce. And we, we've already heard all about Lincoln. I think we have our <laughs> views of him at this point. But there are other, pe- other people did exist. <laughs> there, were, you know, there was an alternative way of thinking about the world. So again, the, the book is Poetry Night at the Ballpark and Other Scenes from an Alternative America. Bill, let's pause for a moment and thank our sponsor. Hey, everybody, if you're like me, you're interested in owning precious metals. But you may not know how to get started. Where do I get them? Who's reputable? Well, do what I do. I get all my gold and silver from Schiff Gold because it's Peter Schiff's gold company. So I know they're going to be reputable, and I know people who work for Schiff Gold are going to know what they're talking about, and I know I'm always going to have a pleasant and efficient buying experience, which I've always had with Schiff Gold. Well, now to get you started in the world of precious metals, Schiff Gold is holding a special sweepstakes just for listeners of this show. They're giving away a one-ounce Canadian gold maple leaf coin worth about $1,200, one of the most popular gold coins in the world. And you can enter this sweepstakes for free at tomwoods.com slash gold. you got to enter by midnight July 13th, 2015. I will be announcing the winner on July 15th, and it's going to be very exciting. Costs you nothing to enter at tomwoods.com slash gold. So what are you waiting for? So again, the, the book is Poetry Night at the Ballpark and Other Scenes from an Alternative America. You have a section in here. I already knew where it was going before I read it, but that's because I've read you before. The, the piece is called George W. Bush, Anti-Family President. Go, run with that. Uh, Bush's, uh, this was the, uh, uh, you know, in the, I think I wrote it in the in aftermath of the, uh, of the Iraq War, Iraq War II. Um, it always blew me away that the, Family values, right, or at least its its D.C. establishment incarnation was wedded to the Republican Party when the militaristic wing of the Republicans, uh, you know, led by Bush and Cheney and such, were in the process of tearing families apart. Um, you know, there's a long literature going back to the Second World War about the effect of lengthy deployments uh, on marriages. Um, you know, always increased divorce rates in time of war. Also increased suicide rates from returning soldiers. Uh, there are 
displacements. You know, people are uh, people move. Uh, you know, part of it's uh, forcible, the soldier, but part of it, the family, maybe. You know, traveling to be with the soldier or near the soldier, uh, and you all of a sudden you're uprooted from. Uh, you're detached from this community of support that you've always enjoyed. You know, people who watch your kids and such, the grandmother, the aunts, the uncles. Um, and yet, uh, and also the uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, none other than Hillary Clinton, has praised the Army's daycare uh, system. Uh, I think she's called it what? It's, it's called the Total Army Family, something like that. It has some, it's some kind of Orwellian ringing yeah. uh, uh, title to it. And in fact, the, the Army, uh, through the Lanham Act of the 40s, was the really a pioneer in government subsidized daycare. And yet, you know, the Bush right is indifferent. I mean, they, they carve out this enormous exception uh, for anything having to do with a national security state. And so in my view, uh, you know, Bush was a very, Bush, the Bush administration was very anti-family. The only candidate I remember making this point, it was actually Ralph Nader, another guy who kind of escapes the, uh, in some ways, especially in, in, in recent years, escapes the left-right prison. Uh, but, you know, and then we see, in, you know, 2016 is gearing up. Uh, these guys will give lip service to family values. But, in fact, I don't see, uh, you know, any dissent, except perhaps from Ron Paul, or Rand Paul, rather, uh, any dissent to this uh, mobilized, bellicose, ready-for-war uh, posture with which the, the GOP has become, uh, you know, synonymous in recent years. Uh, I actually had Ralph Nader on the show some time ago. I'll, I'll link to that on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 425. It was a very cordial and interesting conversation, as I'm sure you would expect that it, it would be. Yeah. It, it was, I, I was very glad to be able to do it. In your subtitle here, you talk about an alternative America, and that, to me, is what Bill Kaufman has been all about. Paint us a picture of what is this alternative America that you're capturing in some of these writings. Um, well, you know, I always thought there were two Americas. Actually, there are many, many Americas, let a thousand flowers bloom and all that. But there's, there's the televised America that if you ask someone who gets his information only from the idiot box, you say, okay, there's this America that consists of The View and uh, Dick Cheney and, and Katie Couric and Caitlyn Jenner. You know, <laughs> there's, there's that America. Uh, but then there's the America that, that I experience just in everyday life. Um, and it's an America you never see on television. It's an America of little churches and, and baseball and uh, backyard gardens and such. You know, it's a, uh, it's a much more modest and, uh, I think, humane and interconnected America. And to me, it's produced... Most of the uh, most of the good things uh, we have in, in 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 this country, and a lot of the interesting uh, you know pieces of art and 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 novels and literary traditions and political eruptions have come from this this other America. And so I've been you know I've been lucky that well geez for 30 years now I've been able to uh, to write about these little pieces of it. And sometimes they might seem like footnotes or whatever, but to, but to me, the shun pikes, you know, the side roads, that's where you find the interesting stuff, you know, you don't, you don't find it barreling down the interstate at, uh, you know, the international system of interstate and defense highways at 75 miles an hour. The interesting stuff is on the side roads, and that's where I've chosen to spend uh, most of my career. And people, uh, the people whom you find in this alternative America, uh, so often, at least in the past, have uh, generally been of the mind-your-own-business bent when it comes to foreign policy. And this, of course, is dismissed as you know, sneeringly as isolationism. But what it seems to follow from is, I have plenty of my own concerns right here in my town. I have more than enough to keep me busy for the rest of my life. And worrying about uh, you know voting rights in some country halfway around the world is just not something that it would be responsible of me to be spending my time on. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And yet we are hectored to, to pay attention to Baghdad instead of our own backyards. And, you know, my, uh, my overwhelming uh, tendency, as well as those of the most people I write about, is, is to pay attention to your backyard. I mean, there's, you know, there are, uh, there are possibly vivid and, and, and colorful and flavorful things going on there. And that's, and that's where you can really make 
a difference, you know? Otherwise, I mean, what is, uh, even, even engaging in national politics, and I'm not putting it down, and I, I always vote, and I support candidates and such, but really, you are a, you and I are subjects, not citizens of the American empire. If I don't, if I'm upset about the war or some federal policy, what can I do? I write a letter and receive a computer-generated response back. But at the local level, I can actually make some kind of difference. And I, I think that the only way we're going to start any kind of American regeneration or halt this terrible slide we're on uh, is by, you know, is by 10,000 of us paying attention to things in our own backyard. You know, it's it's funny. There's a there's a book that Ron Paul wrote back in 2008 called "The Revolution: A Manifesto." And when the Italian translation of that book came out, they titled it because that title wouldn't mean anything to them. So they titled it "The Third America," <laughs> which I thought was such an evocative title because, of, of course, they mean that as versus Hillary Clinton and Mitt Romney's America. Mm -hmm. There's Ron Paul's America, that Third America. I thought that usually publishers, I find. Well, I, I shouldn't say this, but they can be obtuse. <laughs> no. But th this publisher really got to the heart of what of what Ron was all about. Now, can I just ask you something though? I've, I I I totally admire your stance on these issues and your your belief in regionalism and localism. I absolutely admire that, and I know you still live more or less where you grew up, and I think that's fantastic. But what about somebody who says, look, I, look, I grew up in an abusive household in a rotten town full of, uh, you know, rednecks who were, are just the enemies of civilization, mm -hmm. and from a Mencken-esque standpoint, I've just got to get out of here. What do you say to that? Like, I need mobility. I can't be tied to my locality. I got to get out of here. Oh yeah, no, I, 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 completely sympathetic. And uh, I mean, I've never argued that people should live in their hometowns, but I guess uh, what I like, I like to, uh, I like the old line of Booker T. Washington, who said, "Cast down your buckets where you are." Uh, and what he means by that is, you know, it might not be your hometown, your home place, but once you find a place in which you're comfortable, in which you think you can make a life, make a stand, um, you know, immerse yourself in the local life. And there are many ways of doing that, it, it, you know, whether it's through church or uh, coaching Little League team or politics, whatever. But pay attention to the things that are around you. And, uh, come to learn why, why, do people, why do people love the place you live in, you know? I mean, what's distinctive about it? What's its history? And the history is good and bad and, and warts and all. I mean, uh, but... Uh, you know, so I think uh, no, you don't. You, you don't have. You don't have to live where you were born, but you need to make yourself to use a Wendell Berry line native to your place. Um, and I think that uh, you know, and I think I think just anecdotally, I think more people are doing that. I think people really sense that we're way off track in this country. There's a great dissatisfaction with the status quo. People are casting about for alternatives and. Uh, uh, in little ways, you see them, I think, lighting upon this alternative. So, uh, you know, and part of, partly it's just I'm kind of a general optimist, but uh, there are signs of hope. Bill, before I let you go, the last time you were here, we talked about uh, the film Copperhead, for which you wrote the screenplay. And that was one of my favorite episodes. I really enjoyed that conversation. But given that you have some experience in that and that you've written about uh, movies, and you have a section on movies here in Poetry Night at the Ballpark. Can we close with you telling us, uh, giving us one or two examples of a film that really brings out the some of the Bill Kaufman American themes? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you one. Uh, Hoosiers, uh, one of the greatest sports movies ever made, uh, which is about, which was actually written by uh, written by an Indianan, Angelo Pizzo. Pizzo, and uh, directed by an Indiana, David Anspaugh, starring a couple Midwesterners, Gene Hackman and uh, Dennis Hopper. And it's about, it's based on the story of Milan, Indiana, which uh, won in the early 50s, I forget what year, 51, 52, the Indiana State Basketball Championship. It was a very small school, and there were no classes, so, you know, they'd have to play school, you know, in the ter state tournament, they'd have to play schools, whether from Indianapolis or South Bend or Fort Wayne, the big cities. Um, and it's, uh, but it's a lovely story, not so much about basketball, but about this little community coming together. Um, and it's also, and it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a strong David and Goliath element to it. Um, and it's also about, 
the importance of the centrality, really, of little schools to a community. And in this case, it's a, it's a public school, as most little schools are. Um, but that's, that's sort of beside the point. The uh, important thing is that uh, these people have grown up with each other. They know each other. Um, they live in this far out of the way place and no one gives them a chance. And yet there's a, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a lovely, lovely story that, uh, uh, that I think dramatizes a lot of these points. And, uh, actually I have a chapter about it in the book. I, I interviewed, uh, the author, uh, Angelo Pizzo several years ago. He, uh, he and his wife moved back to Bloomington, uh, Indiana, his hometown, uh, he's also written, there's another very good sports movie he wrote, not quite as good as Hoosiers. It's called Rudy, about Notre Dame. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess Hoosiers is the one that I would instance, apart from Copperhead, which, uh, which I should say is available now on DVD and Blu-ray. So, Well, in fact, I will, why, why don't I link to that, too? I that would be to that. Link would, to Copperhead also. Yes, we can. Yeah, so th- definitely the... Clearing house for this episode to help you get the most out of this episode, tomwoods.com slash 425. We'll link to Copperhead, and we will link to the book we've been talking about, Poetry Night at the Ballpark, and other scenes from an alternative America. We'll also link to your website, billkaufman.net, and Kaufman is two Fs and one N. We'll link to Front Porch Republic, where you write, and uh, maybe we'll link to your American Conservative Archive. Why not? Yeah, right? why not? If I can, sure. if I can find that. Yeah, it's a it's a linkathon. Am I leaving anything out? <laughs> no, I think so. I, I don't think I have a police record on the internet or anything. So no, I guess we're okay. <laughs> okay, not yet anyway. <laughs> All right, well, Bill, I appreciate uh, our conversation as always, and uh, best of luck with the book. And I want to urge people uh, to to read it because you'll you'll enjoy it. You'll learn things, and you'll also learn how to write well, because Bill is one of maybe a, a handful, maybe a half dozen people whose writing I genuinely envy. So when people say to me, how do I become a better writer? Well, I would say read Bill Kaufman. I still don't know, I would say probably every fourth or fifth page has a word I have never in my life seen. A lot, a lot of those I just make never. up, Tom. Don't worry about <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would explain it. But anyway, I, I mean, it's the writing is great, the content's great, and you're going to be learning a lot of interesting stuff and enjoying yourself in the process. You know, that's that's about all you can ask of an author, and and you've delivered. Uh, thanks again, Bill. I had a great time, Tom. As always, thanks. All right, everybody, make sure and check out the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 425, where we will be linking to all kinds of wonderful Bill Kaufman resources and related episodes where we hash out similar issues to the ones we talked about today. Remember, we've got a brand new course over at libertyclassroom.com, The History of Conservatism and Libertarianism. Unfortunately, all too few conservatives and libertarians know that history which is why so much nonsense goes unanswered. But you will know it if you check that out. Get all the courses we've got over at libertyclassroom.com and make sure and use coupon code SHOW in all caps to get the discount you are entitled to as a listener of this show. Tomorrow we're talking about the police and a startling statistic about police killings from our friend Professor Ed Stringham. You're not going to want to miss that. So make sure and subscribe to the show on iTunes or Stitcher over at TomWoods.com, and we'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.